Hello everybody and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today we are going to talk about the myth that there are three post-flood branches in the human uh, phylogeny, specifically the mitochondrial phylogeny. In other words, there are three clades of human mitochondrial DNA. That's our myth for today. So a little bit of background on this myth. It is required to make the young earth creationist or yek narrative work. Basically, if you follow that narrative, uh, Noah was a, uh, a literal historical figure. His sons and their wives were literal historical figures who existed. And they represent a bottleneck in the history of humanity. All modern humans, all extant humans, are descended from Noah's family. So Noah had three sons, each of whom was married. The identity of Noah's uh, daughters-in-law is not revealed in the Bible, but we know that all human mitochondrial DNA that exists today has to go through those three daughters-in-law. So if we draw this out graphically, this is the phylogeny we get. We have Adam and Eve, we have Noah, we have Noah's three sons, one, two, three, and each of them is married, and the descendants of those three couples represent all extant humans. Now, because mitochondrial DNA is only inherited maternally, that is to say, through the mother, we have three distinct mitochondrial lineages here, one for each of Noah's daughters-in-law. So we should be able to look at mitochondrial DNA in modern humans and identify these three clades of mitochondrial DNA. To simplify this representation a little bit, we can look at it like this. We have Eve, which in the parlance of uh, coalescence analysis for the mitochondrial DNA represents the mitochondrial Eve, the literal Eve in this case is also mitochondrial Eve. And then eventually descended from Eve, you have the three wives of Noah's sons, and all human mitochondrial DNA is descended from those three individuals. So again, we should have three distinct clades of human mitochondrial DNA, or three lineages of human mitochondrial DNA. So the science behind this, uh, we, can, we can look at Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's claims on this issue, because he's actually plotted out phylogenies of human mitochondrial DNA, and he claims to have identified three distinct mitochondrial DNA branches, where each branch, or the, the common ancestor of each branch, corresponds to one of Noah's daughters-in-law. He claims that this confirms or, or is at least evidence for the Yek narrative. So if you have a, uh, a mitochondrial phylogeny and you could identify three distinct nodes, then you could say those are the three daughters-in-law, and that is, that is consistent with the Yek narrative. So this is Jensen's mitochondrial phylogeny. This is from a blog post on AIG called On the Origin of Human Mitochondrial DNA Differences. I think this is from 2016. It might be more recent, 17 or 18. Um, but it builds on some other work he did showing similar figures from 2015. Uh, but the, there's a lot going on here. Most of what we see here doesn't matter. The important thing are these three arrows in green. So we've got one right here, one right in the middle, and then one right here. And these represent, these three nodes represent kind of the three epicenters of mitochondrial diversity. And you can see there's a lot of descendants from each of those nodes. So you've got branches here, branches going out this way, and then from this one, this whole blade down here is descended from that node if you, if you put the common ancestor on the tree upstream of that node, right? So these three nodes, one, two, three, those are the relevant ones. And Jensen claims those represent the uh, three uh, wives of Noah's sons, from which all extant mitochondrial lineages are descended. So let's talk about why Jensen is wrong about this. The simple reason is that tree doesn't show what Jensen claims. Jensen claims it shows three distinct lineages. That's not true, because it's an unrooted tree. So to get at this, we have to talk a little bit about phylogenies and phylogenetics and how to read these types of figures. So first, let's talk about rooting. When you make a phylogenetic tree, when you're showing the evolutionary relationships among different lineages, that tree can be rooted or unrooted. A rooted tree indicates the relatedness of all the, the, the lineages you're looking at, and 
it indicates the most recent common ancestor. Basically, you're saying this part of the tree right here represents the common ancestor that everything else is descended from. When you make an unrooted tree, you're omitting the most recent common ancestor. You're just showing the relationships or the relatedness among a bunch of different lineages, but you're not making a judgment call and saying, here's where the ancestor is from which all of these things are descended. Another way to say this is that an unrooted tree doesn't have an evolutionary direction, whereas a rooted tree says, here is the direction over time where these changes are happening. You start with the ancestor and you move to the descendants. So here's an example of this. We can use this simple tree with four uh, uh, extant taxa, A, B, C, and D, and two nodes, node number one and node number two. Node is just branch point. Those two words mean the same thing. And we can generate lots of different trees from this unrooted tree based on where we root it. And the important thing as we go through this is I want you to see the relationships between A, B, C, and D and nodes one and two as we root this tree in different places. So one place we could root it is we could say this branch, this red branch leading to A, the common ancestor is somewhere along that branch. So when we do that, we say, okay, our most recent common ancestor is along A, so A branches off first, then you get to node one, and then B branches off and you go down this middle run, and then you get to node two, and then C and D diverge from each other. Or you could uh, root it at B and you basically flip A and B in the rooted phylogenies. You could also do the same thing for C and D, and you'll get two different trees. We're not going to go through each of them. You see how this works. You root it at C, and then you get to node 2, D branches off, then across to node 1, or you could root it at D, and it starts with the purple D branch, and then it goes to node 2, C, and then across to 1, A and B. And there's one more thing you could do called midpoint rooting, where you take kind of the middle consensus for this tree and you root it right there. In that case, you have two branches, one leading to node one, one leading to node two, and then A and B and C and D branch off from there. The point is that when you root the tree, you're giving it evolutionary direction. You're saying, here's where the ancestor is, here's the descendants, okay? Now, the tree we just looked at for Jensen, unrooted tree. So he's looking at what this middle one is. He's not saying where the ancestor and descendants are, on that tree. He's just pointing out relationships. So let's label, let's go back to Jensen now and see if we can convert this unrooted tree into a rooted tree and see if it's still compatible with the YEC narrative. So I've labeled the three nodes A, B, and C here, and we're going to simplify this tree in a second, but you see we've got this node right here, that's A, the one in the middle is B, and the one down here is C. So let's simplify this tree, okay? We've got A, B, and C. Again, B is the one in the middle, A and C are to either side. Now I'm gonna draw some other versions of this tree. I'm not going to include these other branches. These are not relevant. We just care about how the nodes, A, B, and C, are related to each other. Now for reference, here's the Yak narrative that Jensen claims his tree supports. You've got a common ancestor, Eve, and then you have three coexisting individuals and then three clades descended, one from each of those individuals, right? A, B, and C. That's what Jensen claims his tree right here shows. But that's not what his tree actually shows. If you root it at the nodes, you get three options. If you say A represents the ancestor and B and C are descended, you don't get a situation where you have three coexisting individuals. You get a situation where B is descended from A and C is descended from B, right? A represents the root, and then the first group of individuals branch off, B is among them, and then in the descendants from B, you have a bunch of things, and you also have C. That doesn't work. What if we root it at B? Well, this is essentially a midpoint root here, so you're rooting at B, and then you see two different branches where B and C are descended from, or where A and C, rather, are descended from B. That doesn't work either. And if you root it at C, you get the same thing as A, just reversed, where it's C at the root, and then B is descended from C, and A is descended from B. None of these are compatible with the Yek interpretation. What if we root between the nodes? Jensen talks about this in some of his writings on AIG. He says, well, some people root it at the nodes, but we could also root it between the nodes. 
But guess what? That still doesn't work. And we have two options here. You could root it along the AB branch, or you could root it along the BC branch. Well, when we do that along the AB branch, we get A kind of off to one side, and then you hit B, and C is descended from B. It's nested within B. When you do it the other way, you get the opposite confirmation with C on its own, and then again, B in the middle, right? Because you hit, if you start here, you hit B first, and then descended from B, you have A. Again, neither of these are compatible with the YEC narrative. What we've seen are all the potential interpretations of Jensen's tree, and there is no way to root that tree and make it fit the young Earth creationist narrative. So let's look at Jensen's tree, his real tree, and root it for real using the actual techniques. These figures come from Evograd's excellent debunking of uh, Jensen's book, Replacing Darwin. This is specifically from part six in that series. I will link it down in the description. And I've said this before, but I will say it again. That series is the definitive written takedown of Jensen's book, Replacing Darwin. So here is the unrooted Jensen tree. Uh, this is Evograd's reproduction using the exact same data, gets the exact same tree that we've already seen. The three nodes that Jensen identifies as the three uh, daughters-in-law are shown with the red arrows, one, two, three. And then here we have the rooted tree using the L haplotype of the mitochondrial genome as the ancestor. So we're rooting with the L haplotype, which are the branches that are in black. And then you have the other main branches, M, N and R in the different colors here, pink, uh, kind of turquoise and green. What you see here is that you don't have three coexisting individuals leading to three distinct branches. Instead, you have one node right here that represents the node in the middle, and then descended from that, you have the other two nodes here and here. So you don't have one, two, three, you have a nesting relationship where you have one and then descended from that, the other two. That is apparent from this unrooted tree, but it becomes crystal clear when you root it that you are not representing with the unrooted tree three separate lineages. You are representing a uh, ancestor-descendant relationship. The only question is what is the exact nature of that relationship based on where you place the root of the tree. Uh, Jensen has written that he can root it at the L haplotype, and when you do that, you get the tree shown right here, which violates the requirements of the young earth narrative that you have three distinct clades that do not nest within one another. So to summarize, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen claims the three nodes on a phylogeny of human mitochondrial DNA, an unrooted phylogeny, I should say, represent Noah's daughters in law. He shows this using an unrooted tree, but misreads the tree um, not realizing that the way that tree is shown represents ancestor-descendant relationships. The rooted or unrooted, the relationships contradict the young earth narrative. So the conclusion is that there are not three distinct branches of human mitochondrial DNA as the young earth narrative requires. Instead, as with all DNA, with all lineages, there are ancestor-descendant relationships, and there is a nested hierarchical pattern, which is exactly what you would expect based on evolutionary theory. Now, I have one more note here I want to make. Jensen claims to root his tree at the L haplotype, or at least says you can root it at the L haplotype, using the L haplotype as the ancestral state. Uh, many online young earth creationists have repeated this claim many, many times, uh, and I've issued privately uh, a challenge to some of them, and I'm reiterating it publicly here. I've read Jensen's book, and I think I've read all of his blog posts on AIG. I think I've read everything he's written on AIG. In all of that work, he only shows unrooted trees. He never shows a rooted tree. If I am wrong, link me to the place where he has shown a rooted tree for the human mitochondrial DNA, and I'll publicly issue a correction and apology on air. If I'm mistaken, happy to correct myself. I don't think I am, but by all means, correct me. Just send me that link, and that's what you'll get. So, are there three post-flood human branches of mitochondrial DNA? No. As we just showed, that is a creation myth. Thank you for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. I will see you soon, and don't get fooled.